We're going on a field trip to spend some time with Roy Underhill in Kansas City, this time an old-timey woodworking. Hi, I'm Stumpy Nubs, and this is Old Timey Woodworking. If you're new to the show, it's all about preserving the tools and the techniques of the past. You can find old episodes at StumpyNubs.com, and there you can also find my informative and entertaining blog titled The Woodwrights Review, which gives you an insider look at the only show that's better than Old Timey Woodworking. Roy Underhill has been filming The Woodwright Shop since I was just a little nub, and it's no secret that he has inspired me and thousands of other woodworkers. So about a year ago, I started going through the old original episodes one at a time and writing a series of in-depth reviews full of tips, tricks, and background information for the aspiring Woodwright. We just began season two, and to kick it off in style, I got a hold of Roy and set up a meeting. As it turned out, both Roy and I were scheduled to be speakers at this year's Woodworking in America event in Kansas City. So I decided to spend some time together in front of the audience talking about all sorts of behind the scenes stuff. It was a once in a lifetime experience, and you had to be there to hear the whole thing. But for this special edition of Old Timey Woodworking, I've put together some of the best parts, focusing on Roy and his show. Now, we weren't really set up for proper filming, and the sound is pretty bad, but that's the price you pay for missing the live event. So without further ado, here's Roy Underhill and me, Stumpy Nubs, at WIA 2015. Making an intellectual uh, understanding uh, uh, of what people who work wood know intuitively. You know, give you a piece of wood, you would stand it up on end to split it. You wouldn't lay it down sideways because you know which way the grain goes. But if you pay a whole lot of money and go to graduate school, you can write a thesis about that, <laughs> about splitting firewood, about working with the grain. It was just fascinating. Yeah. No, I didn't. I presented it. I got to do a showbiz thesis. That's it. And somebody saw it and said, this would work on television. And I'm like, oh, you're trying. Uh, they turned it down the first year. It was a handful of uh, so anyway, I came back. They said, couldn't you do something on using, you know, mix it up? I said, no, I want to do it the way I did it. Well, the next time I came back to make the pitch to the producer at PBS, I brought my axe with me. And he quickly agreed. I don't know what it was. <laughs> that may have been it. Uh, but nevertheless, they gave it a go and it worked. Well, my bees had even left me. Yeah, it's tough. My first uh, daughter was born, needed the, the work real bad. And I tried to uh, I put in a proposal to work for Claudia Williamsburg. Uh, and nothing back from that. Had the proposal into uh, public television. Nothing came back. And uh, both of them came in within 20 minutes of each other at my lowest point. So, all right. Well, the director kept yelling, cut, cut, and I thought he meant me, you know, so my hands uh, suffered a bit. I met a fellow at a PBS convention who said, you don't know me, but I had a big influence on your life. I'm the guy who takes all of these tapes that come in from regional stations and people who think they've got a great idea for a television show. I screen them, and I see which ones we're going to put up to PBS. That's my job. I was uh, having a little bit of gastric distress, and I was in the bathroom. My secretary was screening the cassettes for me. I come back, and she's laughing. And I said, well, what, what? She said, oh, you wouldn't believe it. This, this fool cut himself. It's bleeding all over the place. Look at him. said, oh, yeah? So anyway, it was the episode where I cut myself badly. First season. Yes, first season. He's looking at that. Oh, my. Well, all right. You put it in the he said, that's why you have a job today. And then the elevator opens and he gets out and says, never see me again. I kind of fell into it. It was pretty well there. Uh, I learned to plan a little bit better. <laughs> and uh, uh, learned what uh, the limits of vulgarity that was accepted in public broadcasting systems. <laughs> 
the uh, early seasons you did in two takes, the whole thing straight through in two takes, all right? One, yeah, it's usually one. Yeah. Well, we had. Well, we would try to get uh, two shots in, but yes, we, yeah, everything is one Not shot, like one take, take, one Why? shot, one take. That's it. Is that more of a challenge when you have guests come? Like keep that whole thing. Up? Somewhat, and particularly if they're holding something and moving it around, and like this for the uh, uh, and the, the poor guy trying to do the close-up camera. Think about it. If you're running a close-up camera, uh, it's like holding a three by five window, three by five inch wire window, on the end of a 15 foot bamboo pole, trying to keep it on that where you want that close-up. And if somebody's not used to it, they're moving it all around. How can you follow that? You can't. And so I have to grab their hands, you know, and. and Hold it and they hold the object, and I turn, you know, and people say, Will you get your hands off of that stuff? Yeah, Mr. Underhill, you keep blocking. I'm trying to get the guy to hold it still so we can get, they can get the close up. So we have one shot at it. The program has to be cheaper than the test pattern. And that's the only reason we're still on right now. We're cheaper than bars in town, we get to stay on. But I'm told now and then I get hints from public television that it's actually more expensive for them to do the paperwork to take us off the air than it is to keep us on. It, is, it has got to be that cheap. <laughs> uh, it seriously is. And they, uh, it, that one shot, one take thing makes it. You probably got more invested in our, our podcast here. Yes, yes, that's but no, the uh, well, the first one was my shop. Uh, uh, was, had no heat uh, or, or way of controlling the, the environment. It, it killed the crew and the cameras back then. Uh, but then, then I built another building and we've been in that one. So come visit if you get a chance. If you're out that way, uh, you do what I did when I left Williamsburg. I just put on a, a that you know, that tricorn colonial hat. And started walking south until somebody said, What is that? And then I knew I'd gone far enough. <laughs> I can't believe nobody asked about the hat. No, this hat, this is, I'm very proud to say this hat has been uh, designated an EPA super fund site. <laughs> uh, so. <laughs> it's pretty nasty. <laughs> and look, actually, there's hair still there. <laughs> uh, and the reason for that is, I, you know, I work with a spring pole lathe, and you know how that works? It hits you, I put that, fill the hat with shavings. And so when the pole hits you, it absorbs a lot of that. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> I'm a heavy smoker. I got the hookah right off stage so and all the time. Uh, no, it's just physically uh, an athletic event, really. You've got to keep the tail at 22 minutes and 27 seconds. And so that's uh, but you're, what you're saying. What is implied in your question, sir, when you say, do you work it out at all because you're always winded? Now, what's implied in that is you ought to start working out, pal. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, I, I just I, people think love Chris and Peter Pollan. Yeah, Peter, Peter Pollan's theory and uh, Chris Schwartz uh, actually just really worked well. And I just did a program with uh, Peter Ross, the blacksmith, and all of them. They get uh, mail individually and will confess to me that. Uh, their most favorable mail comes in, and the people say, uh, oh, I enjoy when you give Roy grief and get after him and get his hands or something. You know. Let me tell you, you probably know. If you want to generate mail uh, uh, of all kinds, just use the word uh, free drill on television. And the mail will come in. Dear Mr. Underhill, I have written you and Mr. Abrams countless times, and let I, yet I still hear you say, pre-drill. You cannot pre-drill anything. You can only drill. How do you pre-drill? This cannot be done. Will you please? Th so, I have learned. That's one of the things I've learned. Yeah. And that's one of the things that uh, you can find folks who uh, teach with uh, the hand tools. A lot of people execute these hand tools. I'm a 
try and also find folks who understand the history of this and make those deep connections. We only yes. know what will survive. Well, we, we do, and uh, we do. There's a, a lot of ephemeral, exactly, what survived. The best work survived. You say, boy, they made everything to last back then, didn't they? Well, the only thing that they made is that lasted is the stuff they made really well. So all the crap they made is long gone. Uh, so they did everything great back then. So there is, that's where we have knowledge to gain. It's in the more ephemeral stuff, the stuff that's not made to last, which is contemporary, and there's a lot of uh, room for error in that. Where I find, though, because uh, you asked me if I could twist it a little bit, the uh, discovery is what each and every one of us makes when we cut a board, we split it open, we look in there, the grain is always different. Every time you touch a plane to the wood, it's giving you feedback, and that's the discovery that we have to keep making. And each one of us always working with the natural material, and I think that's what's uh, so important. We evolved working with wood, and we wouldn't be who we are and have the capabilities we have today if we, if we uh, had not. I think the wood shaped us just as we have shaped it. right there in, in Chapel Hill. It's in an old downtown, and I should tell you, you never know uh, what your dreams tell you. I knew that I wanted a school that was in an old downtown of an old neighborhood. I wanted people walking by. And I knew I wanted a glass window, and I wanted people to look in the front and see all these workbenches and people working with hand tools. And that, that was just my image. And, and uh, luckily, I got to make it come true. And I was four years into running the school when I looked up and I saw the people walking by and looking in and holding up their kids to look in. And then I realized that's what it's all about. Because when you've got people working at their benches, they're already sold on the idea. They do this somewhere else. They're after it. It's the folks behind the glass there looking in and seeing it for the first time. You go, what the heck is this? That's where your subversive woodworking takes place. That's what it's all about. If you want to reach the unreached, that's, that's the way to do it. So I said, oh my gosh, that does it. So I always tell the students that come in, I said, you are teachers here. The folks behind the glass are the real students. Williamsburg Restored Village has all these different craftsmen. So if you want to talk to an expert, the world's the most knowledgeable cooper, wheelwright, blacksmith, gunsmith, they're, they're a block away. You walk down and say, you know, how much do you think this, how you can do this? They, they're right there. But not only that, uh, your visitors that are coming, the people who you talk to, the thousand plus people you talk to every day, uh, showing whatever it is you're uh, in charge of there, they all bring knowledge that uh, feeds to this. You know, I'd be sawing wood there with a two-man cross-cut saw with somebody, and this fellow would look at it just shaking his head, say, oh my God, you know, I was uh, in Latvia, a young man, I was, we were all imprisoned by the Nazis, and I had to cut uh, wood like that. I swore I'd never touch one of those again, but let me show you how to do that, really. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so what the heck? You see these guys who've just been through these incredible experiences and perspectives on things, and uh, that really enriches you. Now, so I stopped working with the public and, uh, and in that environment and started missing that feedback. I was there for 20 some years, and the fight, but the constant fight and drum music finally got to me. I could not take it one standing minute long. That, 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 that was it. I, uh, no, I was not a uh, happy camper, and so I hope there's nobody to take it my place or they're most unhappy. But nobody uh, as a uh, uh, irksome. I wanted to change things. It, it was not a, not a place to be really wanting to change things. Actually, my great uncle, he was uh, uh, raised, I'm a TV woodworker. Uh, my great uncle back in the 1930s was uh, uh, a radio woodworker, and which sounds tough, you know, because I show how to do dovetails, how to do a half line dovetail drawer, and I've got the pictures. Uh, and so they said, doing it on the radio. And I was 
Well, what they discovered was they didn't have to make anything, actually. They, uh, they just did the sound effects. So it would be... Yeah, that looks pretty good, that there, uh, that, that Chippendale high boy you cut out today. Uh, let's see how you carve that eagle. Oh, yeah, well, look at this. Here's how you do it. Wow, that eagle's beak is coming out great. Their feathers look real. They're almost fluffy. And that's if people would tune in every week to hear this, this woodworking show. <laughs> but nevertheless, that's the story of Calvin Aubrey, a woodworker. And I present you with this one piece book stand, beautifully finished, and it says, For Stumpy of His Nubness, may the grain be with you. So there you are, there you are. This was my great grandfather's hand saw. He painted everything wood. And I grew up woodworking with just this saw. You know that this did, he considered for this thing? D9. D9, you bet. I had it when I was uh, still in college and I was working. And uh, I, uh, as soon as I picked up that distant rip saw and started ripping, I guess there's some oak flooring for a house I was working on. Uh, and I just said, man, I looked at this thing, uh, this wonderful rip saw, and I said, you and me, boy, I tell you, we can make a living, you know, we <laughs> partners. Uh, it was great, just that thing, you know, you light on something, I'm sure each of you have had that, you just say, I can do this, we're going to stick together. And uh, so I just found a partner that this to be on. I don't remember where I got it, a tool auction, but I, I like this one, it was 1828. Yeah, yeah, and you see how it's not the standard length, uh, standard planes are nine and a half inches long. This is longer. The great character. I appreciate the history that's behind the tool. You know, kind of imagine the person that owned it. It's easier with his name on it. Yeah. You can see his gouge marks for why he's up. That's still there. Uh, you have a hand plane that you particularly like? Well, I have the jack plane with the branch and uh, a long jointer, a single iron jointer. So it's one of my favorites. Uh, this uh, jack plane, the handle for you know, if you have a wooden jack plane with a, with a wooden handle, it had snapped off on this plane, broken, it didn't hold up. The fellow replaced it with a dogwood branch, like a ship's knee, coming up like that with the grain going around the corner. So I admire that greatly, that uh, ingenuity uh, and individuality. Jump ship back in, uh, oh gosh, that was in Shanghai. Made my way over the Himalayas into Nepal and uh, had a little woodworking school there, teaching woodworking. Who's in my class with the Dalai Lama? Right? So I'm giving extra attention. I'm working, you know, helping him out, getting them dovetails just right. And at the end, you know, it, I think, you know, there's going to be a little extra. And, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's, not, he's, not, he's, gonna, he's packing up, he's going to stiff me, right? <laughs> and, you know, and I say, hey, Lama, you know, how about a little something, you know, for the effort? And he says, oh, no, 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 no. It will not be money. But when you die, you will get complete, total consciousness. <laughs> so I got that going for me, which is great. <laughs> now let's go. Thanks to Roy Underhill for being such a good sport and for the nice book stand he made me. We'll be building one of these in a future episode of the Old Timey Workshop, so be sure and subscribe to us on YouTube. And don't forget to check out past episodes and my Woodwright Review blog over at StumpyNubs.com. You can also get a copy of Roy's new woodworking novel, Calvin Cobb Radio Woodworker, at LostArtPress.com. There's a link in the show notes below. Until next time, sit back and have yourself a cold one, because you've earned it, my friend.